And today we're going to read about the call of Elisha from 1 Kings. Here we read about Elijah and then the call of Elisha. This is God's word. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, referring back to what happened on Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water and he ate and drank and lay down again and the angel of the lord came again a second time and touched him and said arise and eat for the journey is too great for you and he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to horeb the mount of god there he came to a cave and lodged in it and behold the word of the lord came to him and he said to him What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of uh, Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of uh, Shaphat of Abel Mahula, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was ploughing with twelve oxen, twelve yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, 
For what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. May the Lord bless to us this reading and these readings of his word. Friends, everyone loves a story and especially a good story. And these stories of Elisha are by any reckoning really good. Therefore, it is surprising how little these stories of Elisha are known. We need exposure to stories like these. For these are stories which will grip us and move us and fire us in the right direction. Why do so many, even within the church, ignore such stories? Well, it's not that our generation doesn't enjoy stories. Just think of the novels of today, which sell in huge numbers and which millions devour. Think too of the myriad of films watched worldwide. And think of the soup operas on television, followed by millions, episode by episode, week by week. And so it isn't that we aren't interested in stories in our day. It's simply that we're taken up with the wrong ones. We live in a culture marked by lust, unfaithfulness, rebellion, violence, instant gratification, broken relationships, hopelessness, escapism, and futility. Most stories which captivate people today reflect such dark, depressing themes. What we need are stories which reflect the message of hope contained in the Bible. There is tremendous power in the stories of Elisha. For one thing, these stories force us to examine all of our assumptions. These stories expose our false assumptions and they open our eyes to an alternative world view. Yes, these episodes of Elisha confront us with a new perspective which brings great blessing to us because these stories are about what God is doing and they are true, they're true and factual. They are not fictional stories. Now in our house over the past many years we've had many family movie nights usually on a Friday evening and we take it in turn to choose the film each week. Now in my opinion my choices have been some of the best movies that we have watched as a family but I often get unfair flack and criticism from our gang about my choices because the films I like most and choose to watch are based on true stories. And so at times there are sad twists and turns and sad endings. But very often the films that I've chosen are uplifting and inspirational as the main characters overcome traumatic events. Yet my family, when talking about our film nights, give the unfair impression that my choice of films are typically sad and heartbreaking and leave them in tears. But the truth is these movies are based on real life people and events which usually have a powerful, poignant message. Well, that can certainly be said of these episodes of Elisha recorded for us by God himself in his word. In these inspired stories, you and I can identify with the characters involved and with the situations they faced. And we can enter into the emotions they experienced, both their love and their loss, and their joy and their pain. And it's clear that these characters know what you and I know, that life can often be hard, intimidating and perplexing, and that life in this world is brief. Yet in spite of these harsh realities about life, these individuals we read about who know God, show us how to live life in following the Lord. And in the midst of their crises, 
These believers in the Lord demonstrate how to walk with God in this world. Friends, so much of the Bible consists of real life narrative and stories. Have you ever wondered why this is so? It's because the Bible doesn't deal with abstract, untried philosophies. God's word rather deals with tried and proven realities. And one of the best ways of communicating these life transforming truths about ultimate reality is through stories. God himself is the greatest storyteller ever, as we see throughout his word. And the Lord of heaven clearly values this method of teaching very, very much. Why? Well, to start with, God's stories are concrete. God's stories are about particular people in particular places, confronted with certain circumstances at specific times in history. And therefore, God's stories lend themselves readily to meeting us and to speaking to us in our own situations, in our own day and age. And so in his stories, the Lord speaks to you and me very, very specifically. And his stories are just full to overflowing with pictures which fire our imaginations. And so we never tire of these inspired stories. And it's not just children who love to hear the same stories time and time again. Adults do too. And each time we hear these stories, they set our minds and our imaginations running. And they touch us in fresh ways at different periods of our lives. And as we hear these stories again, it's as if God is taking us into his confidence. And with his loving arm around our shoulders and with an intriguing whisper in our ears, God draws us closer to himself and says, let me tell you a story. And God's stories are unforgettable because in his stories, we catch a glimpse of another world and we begin to see this world quite differently. They're like a good film. God's stories drawing us in and we're there and we can't help but participate in the stories ourselves and we discover their unusual power to change our lives. So God's stories are not tales to read to escape reality. Rather, they are stories to read to find reality. They aren't for entering a fantasy world they are rather for entering the real world as God himself defines it. Friends, gospel churches like ours today need awakening. Well, these ancient God-given God -given stories have the power to awaken us. God, may God use these episodes about Elisha to stir us up to awaken us and to equip us to engage all the more in his service in this era of history in which he has placed you and me. Today we're going to consider the call of Elisha. We'll reflect on how God called this farmer to carry on the work of his prophet Elijah. But before we think about Elisha's call, we need to think first of all about Elijah, his master. The times we live in are days of enormous spiritual need. We all readily acknowledge that. Many today think the church is actually in retreat, that evil has triumphed, and that the Christian cause is all but lost. Many think that God's people are becoming such a shrinking minority that the only thing for the church to do is to, to lie down and to die with dignity. That is the pessimistic view of many today. Well, very sadly, this was also Elijah's attitude at one stage in his ministry. For at that time, things seemed so bleak. Ironically, it was after Elijah's remarkable victory on Mount Carmel that he thought this way. On that momentous, extraordinary day, the Lord's total supremacy over Baal had been displayed in the most dramatic fashion for the whole world to see. 
and the 850 false prophets of Baal had not only been completely discredited, these 850 prophets had actually been slaughtered and were no more. Well, at that point of total victory, Elijah must have expected King Ahab to repent and his demon-worshipping wife, Queen Jezebel, to be rejected. And Elijah must have anticipated a total transformation and revival amongst God's people. But in fact, none of this happened. Instead, it seems that the people just went home from, from Mount Carmel that day, talking about how exciting and sensational it had been. What a wonder, wonderful spectacle they had just witnessed. But they themselves remained unchanged and unrepentant. And as for King Ahab, well, he didn't repent either. Rather, Ahab just told Jezebel what a troublemaker Elijah had been. And he reported to her how the prophets of Baal had been put to death. Well, not surprisingly, Jezebel went ballistic. And she promptly put out a contract on Elijah's life. He was to be killed in the next 24 hours. On hearing this, Elijah was totally devastated. All his great expectations about revival had come to nothing. Elijah felt so alone and abandoned. Elijah was totally disillusioned, disenchanted and dejected. And he fled in fear to the desert. Dark, anxious thoughts tormented him. And he became almost suicidal with disappointment and self-pity. He started saying things that some believers say today. I've had enough. Lord, take my life. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Verses 4 and 10. Friends, this longing for escape in Elijah is replicated in many members and gospel churches today. Many of God's servants in 2024 yearn for a respite and deliverance from ungodliness and unrighteousness that not only marks today's world, but also today's church. Of course, humanly, we can understand Elijah's despondency and dejection, for Elijah was devastated by a massive disappointment. Elijah felt crushed by a seismic sense of letdown, and he was also utterly exhausted physically. But it has to be said, Elijah's despair and despondency was a sinful response. His reaction was unworthy of a servant of God. Elijah didn't just have this contract on his life from Jezebel. First and foremost, Elijah had the call of God on his life. The Almighty had summoned him into his service to be his prophet. Elijah seemed to have forgotten this. And with his life in danger, he thought that all was lost. But of course, Elijah was entirely wrong. This wasn't the end. And he wasn't the only one left. And God's cause was by no means lost. And therefore, the Lord confronted Elijah's despondency and defeatism. God challenged his servant pointedly. What are you doing here, Elijah? And the Lord took Elijah to task for the narrowness of his perspective and for the smallness of his vision. Now, sometimes God needs to do this with his children today. When we get downcast and defeatist because of the sorry state of the nation or the church, we too need to be told, stop looking inwards and look upwards to our great God and get on with what the Lord has set before you to do. Immediate escape is not an option. We have to keep thinking long term. We have to keep looking towards the ongoing, ever expanding triumph of our God in history. Whatever sinful setbacks we face in this world or in the church as Christ's servants, our God's work still goes on. Our Supreme Saviour, our Supreme Saviour's church is still being built and beautified. Our majestic King's kingdom is still expanding and advancing. Our Heavenly Father's saving and sanctifying purposes are still being fulfilled. Elijah had to realize that his ministry was only one episode in a very long-running and God-glorifying story. 
For we need wisdom and humility to recognize the same. By God's amazing grace, we are part of something infinitely great and glorious that has continuity with the past and also perpetuity in the future. And what we're engaged in will end in total triumph and not in terrible tragedy. Christian friends, it will be our God who has the last word and not our evil enemy Satan. Think of relay races in athletics. The key to success in such relay races is twofold. One, good teamwork. And two, a good handover of the baton to the team member who runs the next leg of the race. And the handover, at the handover it's all too easy to fumble or even to drop the baton. Well, living the Christian life is being like in a relay race as well as in a marathon. And both good teamwork and a good handover of the baton are vital if things are to go well in the Lord's work that we're called to. Even though Elijah was a mighty man of God, Elijah nearly flunked on both courts, on both counts. He forgot that he was only one part of the Lord's team. He lost sight of his teammates, that there were others faithfully serving the Lord too. Indeed, Elisha had 6,999 teammates, but he'd forgotten all about them. And he also nearly dropped the baton. God had to remind him that there were others waiting to run. And God spoke to Elijah about one man in particular, his successor, Elisha, who was waiting just a few metres ahead of him around a bend on the track. Elijah was to pass on the baton of his ministry to Elisha. His job was to make the pass as smoothly and efficiently as possible. Christian friends here today, we too live with the legacy of the past. And we too have a job to do now in the present. And we must also look expectantly to the future. For in the great sweep of history, our sovereign Lord has already determined the outcome of this race. We're to be like Elisha. We are to grasp the baton handed on to us from the past. We're to serve the Lord with all of our hearts in the present. And we're also to prepare to hand on the baton to our successors. No runners in a relay race are to seek personal glory. That's imperative for all of us running the Christian race. We're just to be thankful that we are in the race at all by God's amazing grace to us. And we're to be humble about our own particular part within it. We must appreciate that it is a team effort. It doesn't depend entirely upon any one of us. We all have our part to play. And we must do so with humility and gratitude, depending on the Spirit's enabling as we seek to carry out our responsibilities. Yet, friends, we must also realise that each of us has something unique and special to contribute. You have and I have. And so we mustn't undervalue our own part or anybody else's part. Elisha was Elijah's successor. But Elisha did not have the same ministry as Elijah. He didn't have the same task as his master. And so Elisha wasn't to be constantly looking over his shoulder, thinking about his master. He wasn't to live in Elijah's shadow. It is really good and important to know what God has done in previous generations, but we must seek to learn from and we must seek to learn from the past, but we're never to live in the past. Christian friends, hear this today. There is no better time for you and me to be serving the Lord than now. And there's no better place for us to be serving our God than right here at this moment. Serving our Saviour in this generation and in this place is God's will for us right now. The Lord may take us elsewhere in the future, and if he does, he will make it very clear where he wants us to go. But our King 
has you and me here now. And so this is where we are to be serving him today. As we begin our study of the stirring real life stories about Elisha, just note as we come towards a close to a few key points about his call. First of all, the sovereignty involved. The sovereignty involved in Elisha's call. Elisha was a farmer and he was going about his regular work. In verse 19, we're told that he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And Elisha was with the 12th. And so presumably, presumably, Elisha had 11 farm hands plowing with him. Why were so many yoke of oxen needed to plow, do you think? The ground was so hard. Why? Well, there'd been so little rain over the past three and a half years. And the oxen would have become so scrawny and weak during the years of no crops. So that was why Elisha ploughed with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. Well, without warning, Elijah suddenly approached Elisha and threw his cloak around him. But this call was not initiated by Elijah. It was the sovereign Lord behind it. God was the one directing everything. And the call of Elisha was radical and uncompromising. And Elisha felt claimed by God. And Elisha knew that there could be no bargaining or resisting concerning God's call. Friends, God does not look for volunteers. Rather, God calls conscripts. Times are too tough for people who fancy a go, in adverted commas, at serving the Lord. What is needed are men and women, young people and children, who've been chosen and called by God to devote themselves to his service. God's servants must be those who've been constrained by God's Spirit to dedicate their lives to his work. When Elijah threw his cloak on Elisha, Elijah said in effect, Leave all and follow me. You are God's chosen successor to me. Well, Elisha knew what he had to do, and God's Spirit constrained him to obey without questioning. It was like James and John when they left their father's fishing business to follow Jesus, and it was like Levi resigning as a tax officer in order to serve the Saviour. Friends, when God's call comes to us, we're constrained to respond. And this isn't just the experience of high-profile servants of God like Elisha, James and John. This is true of every believer in Jesus. This is how it is with every one of us, born of a spirit. For it's the Lord who chooses and calls each one of us to follow and serve him. Jesus says to all of us who trust him as our saviour, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so every one of us who follows Christ has been chosen and called by God in his sovereignty and grace. What tremendous comfort there is for us in this. It's wonderful encouragement. We're not Christians because we decided to follow Jesus. We're Christians because Christ has personally chosen and calls us to himself. Along with noting the sovereignty involved, note too the surprise involved in Elisha's calling. The Lord's choice of servants is usually strange, and not least to those of us who are chosen. And this truth is, was highlighted by Paul in his letter to the Christian, Christians at Corinth. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards, or influential, or noble. God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and the weak things of the world to shame the strong, and the lowly things of the world, and the despised things to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26 to 29. Friends, in his choosing, God often bypasses the top academics, the well-educated, the articulate, and the sophisticated. And in his choosing, God has usually overlooked those with great ability or dynamic personality. And in his choosing, God has normally purposed to skip over the noble and the well-bred with their distinguished ancestry 
and aristocratic upbringing. Indeed, for the most part, God has handpicked the helpless, the last, the least, and the lowest. Now, there are exceptions, of course, and the Apostle Paul himself was one of them. And so was Selina, Countess of Huntington. The Countess of Huntington, Selina, pointed out that Paul said, Not many chosen by God are noble by birth. Paul didn't say, Not any are noble by birth. Well, Elisha himself appears to have been fairly wealthy. He was a farmer who owned at least 24 oxen. That's equivalent in today's terms to having two or three Massey Ferguson tractors. And Elisha hired at least a dozen labourers. But it was still a great shock that he was called to succeed Elijah. He himself was doubtless amazed that God had chosen him to be his prophet. There were still 7,000 faithful servants of God in Israel. But the Lord called him to be a spokesman. The surprise involved... An old Puritan put, put it like this, God seeth not as man seeth, neither doth he choose men because they're fit, but God fits men because he hath chosen them. So God doesn't choose us because we're fit and able, he fits us because he's chosen us. Thirdly, note the surrender involved in this call. Elisha didn't volunteer for the post. He didn't apply for the job. This was all God's idea. But though Elisha's call was a sovereign act of God, his human response was still of tremendous importance. Elisha's decision to obey God's call was vital. Therefore, when Elijah threw his cloak on Elisha, Elijah walked ahead, for Elisha needed time and space to respond. Elisha needed time on his own. And so Elisha was confronted with a major decision to make and he didn't find it easy but he knew what he had to do yet first he wanted to say goodbye to his parents and so he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and he said let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you Elijah replied go back what have I done to you in effect, Elijah was saying, Elisha, this is between you and God. I'm not forcing you into my service. It's God who's calling you into this. And so Elisha went home to say farewell to his family and to show everyone that he was giving up his farming and his former way of life for good. He did something really radical and terribly shocking. He slaughtered his oxen. In doing so, Elisha was giving up his inheritance and he was saying farewell to his financial security. What a huge step to take, but that wasn't all. Elisha then proceeded to break up and to burn his plough and to boil his oxen on the fire. In setting his plough equipment alight, he was burning his bridges even more. There was definitely no going back to farming now. This was what Elisha was declaring to the world. He meant business. God had called him and he was going to obey. Friends, we too must make ourselves wholly available to God. Of course, it's easy for us to agree with this, but it's not easy to do. Yet note, even though it wasn't easy for Elisha, he wasn't miserable as he took this enormous step of sacrifice. In fact, in burning his yoke and in cooking his meat, what was he really doing in effect? Elisha was really organizing a huge open-air barbecue for everyone. And there was tremendous celebration and joy in what he was doing because he knew that this was of the Lord. And so even though being God's prophet was going to be very costly and difficult, Elisha rejoiced. For it's an unspeakable blessing to walk in God's ways. It's an incredible honor to be a servant of the Lord Most High. Friends, we do not do God a favor in choosing to serve him and surrendering our lives to him. Rather, God shows us amazing favour in choosing us to be his servants. Rejoice each day in such privilege. And finally, note concerning the call of Elisha, the service involved. This is very striking. Elisha's new ministry was a tremendous honour, but there was nothing spectacular or sensational about it. It was very simple service. Note in verse 21, we're told, 
Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his attendant. Friends, servants just get on with what needs doing next. Servants are people who know how to help around their home and in their church and community. Servants of God are always ready to set up the chairs, to serve the coffee, to care for the elderly, to visit the sick or the stressed, to help with the children, to provide practical assistance to those in need, being sensitive to the needs of others. And in everything they do, servants of God pray for God's help, depending on God's power. For Elisha, his calling meant service. Elisha was clearly ready for this. Indeed, Elisha became known as the one who, as we read about in 2 Kings 3 verse 11, he became known as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. For years, that was all Elisha was known for, pouring water as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Elijah Elisha sent out no prayer letters. Elisha, nobody interviewed Elisha for religious magazines. Elisha wrote no book about his life in God's service. Elisha conducted no seminars. Elisha wasn't on the international conference circuit. Elisha just had a reputation for fetching water and pouring it over his master's hands. He was known as a true servant. And so he, he was just the kind of person to take over from Elijah. For the Lord had given Elisha a servant heart. Christian friends, when we're called by God, we are first and foremost called to be servants. God doesn't call you or me to be sensations, to be spectacular, but to be servants. Elisha had a reputation for being a true servant. And it's the only reputation worth having. So as we begin this short series on Elisha, let's learn from this servant of God. Let's rejoice in how our Lord has called us to serve him in this generation. And let's surrender our lives afresh to him. And let's serve him with all of our hearts, in little ways and in bigger ways, in menial tasks and maybe in some major tasks, seeking to do everything in his strength and for his glory. May the Lord so help us all. Let us join again together in prayer.